Hello everyone and welcome to day two of RevX Fest, the Revenue Excellence Festival. RevX Fest is brought to you by the team at Modern Sales Pros. For those of you not familiar with MSP, we are the world's largest and highest quality community for those in sales management, sales leadership, sales and revenue operations, and sales enablement, aka our Modern Sales Pros. Our mission is to create an environment for our members to answer the toughest revenue questions out there. If you're not a member yet, you will be invited to join right after this summit. Now, let's talk about our amazing sponsors for this event, not only this panel, but the entire three-day summit, um, which wouldn't be possible without the help of these amazing uh, innovative companies, the ones that you see here in this slide. Big thanks to them for making RevX Fest happen. To learn more about these innovative companies, click on their Sponsors Booth uh, tab at the top of this event page. Also, while you're there, you can check the full agenda by visiting the Agenda tab at the top of this event page to see the full schedule of events. We have a lot of great events coming up today and tomorrow. Yesterday, we've had a full um, lineup of, of panels that was amazing. Now, here is the agenda for our session, for this session here. I will go over some housekeeping notes, um, and then the speakers will introduce themselves, uh, start the discussion, and there's time for Q&A, so please make sure to send your questions, and then we have some time for, uh, for some key takeaways. So um, without further ado, let's get the speakers introduced. I'm going to pass it to uh, Bridget. She's going to be our moderator for today. So Bridget, you can take it from here. Thanks so much, Eduardo, um, for the lovely introduction. And thanks to the MSP team for putting on this awesome summit and event. Um, and of course, thank you to everybody joining us as well as our panelists. Um, we have an amazing group of uh, panelists today um, from all parts of the RevOps industry um, in SaaS. So excited to have this conversation with all of you. Um, and I'm going to ask you uh, for your introductions, of course, here in a couple of minutes. Um, but first, I'll just start by introducing myself really quickly. Um, my name is Bridget. I am the director of the customer success team at Atrium. I've been working here for um, since February 2020, started as a CSM. Um, and now leading a team of implementation specialists, CSMs, and support. Um, and before I was working in at Atrium and CS, I was actually working in revenue operations as well for a couple of years at other high growth startups. Um, so that's a little about me, um, but let's pass this off to our amazing panelists um, who are gonna be doing most of the talking today. Um, so if everybody could give an intro just around um, where you're at now, what your position is, um, a little bit on your professional background, um, why you're excited to be here, and then lastly, most importantly, as an icebreaker, if you could tell us uh, your favorite place to get ice cream um, or your favorite uh, bakery or just something sweet, because that's what I'm in the mood for today. Um, so if we could get started with Jenny, uh, that would be awesome. Yeah, thanks, Bridget. Um, I'm Jenny Hadlow. I am the SVP of Sales Operations at Checkout.com. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard of Checkout, it is a payments processing company. Um, uh, just for some perspective, as we go into this conversation, it's about 2,000 employees globally, um, of which 400 are commercial employees. So you have a sense of sort of the, the org I'm supporting. Um, prior to Checkout, I spent 11 years at Yext um, from a 30-person startup when I first joined to five years post-IPO. So I've had the pleasure of this journey once before. Wow, that is quite a scale um, at Yext. Um, and if oh, you don't mind, answer the icebreaker. <laughs> yeah, there's a very important question you left out there. <laughs> uh, my favorite place I live in Washington D.C. Um, there's this place called Jetty's, uh, which is very nice sandwich shop. Also has amazing ice cream, and they have a s'mores ice cream flavor, which is my favorite. Mm. Jetty's, it's called. It's called Jetty's. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I will make a note of that um, next time in, I'm in DC. Thanks so much, Jenny. Um, all right. Well, next, we will go with um, Bhushan. Hey, folks. Uh, I'm Bhushan. I manage the solutions and growth function at Everstage. Uh, Everstage is a sales compensation automation platform. Uh, and we basically serve companies of all sizes. Uh, 
uh, close to about 100 employees right now. And previous to that, I used to manage revenue operations at Freshworks, which uh, recently went uh, IPO. So uh, hopefully I can add a few uh, insights to the struggle of what happens before you go there. Amazing. Thanks so much, Lucian. Yeah, and- Yes, uh, you know what I'm yes. going to say. <laughs> yeah, so my favorite uh, dessert place is a place called Annabelle's. Uh, it's near to me. They do uh, good crepes. Uh, uh, I, I'm not a big of an ice cream or a pastry person, so that usually works out for me. Yeah, that sounds amazing. Uh, totally understand if you're not an ice cream guy, but, you know, you gotta got to have something that you're into. So thanks for sharing, Bhushan. Um, all right, Jake. Thanks, Bridget. Nice to meet you. My name is Jake Goldfield. I lead on the SVP of Revenue Operations at SalesLoft right now. SalesLoft is a, a great engagement platform to help sales reps and sales teams make revenue faster. I'm sure a lot of folks are familiar with SalesLoft. We're going to exit the year at about 1,000 employees, and I've been there for seven months now. Prior to SalesLoft, I was at Chronicle Security. We were a small startup that got bought by Google, so I really saw that from scratch through the acquisition phase into post acquisition uh, before that at Cisco Meraki for four years. My, uh, my favorite place in the city is probably Tartine Bakery. I'm just, uh, I just can't, can't go wrong with their bread. Amazing, so you're in San Francisco as well? I am, I live just north of the city, yeah. Nice, which Tartine location are you most often at? Most often at the, uh, the one in the mission. Nice, yeah, that's a good one. Lovely, yeah. thank you, Jake. Um, and Ryan. All right. Uh, Ryan Meeker. I am the VP of Revenue Strategy and Operations at Bill.com and Divi. I've been at Divi for about two years, and a little bit more than a year ago, we were acquired by Bill.com. So we support SMB businesses across the U.S., uh, providing them AP automation, AR functionality, uh, and then spend expense management and controls uh, on the Divi side. So. Uh, I've been in RevOps for 15 years across five different companies now. Um, been through the IPO, been through the acquisition thing. Um, and over the last seven years at uh, my prior company and then Divi, I've built fully distributed revenue operations teams. Uh, as I was remote before, remote was cool. Um, and yeah, so doing that at, at Bill and at Divi right now. And I live in Carmel by the Sea, down south, uh, south of the Bay Area. And my favorite place to get ice cream is Ghirardelli because they actually have a great location right on the Monterey Bay. So you can sit there with kids and you can watch, you know, the sea otters and sea lions as you eat, you know, what is that? You just get the ice cream on the brownies, on the cookies and all that good stuff. So, so that's where I like to take the kids when and they deserve uh, some type of reward. <laughs> Amazing. That's awesome. Um, thank you all for sharing that. It made me realize I haven't shared mine yet. And I think I'm going to go with uh, buy right right now because I just moved to uh, right next to a buy right in San Francisco. Um, it's like a fancy grocery store that is very dangerous to live nearby and they have amazing ice cream. So shout out to buy right. Uh, you guys do a lot of things very well. Um, cool. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Um, there's so much amazing experience that you just shared in your intro already, and it already inspired some new questions that I added um, to my sheet here after hearing how many people have been through acquisitions and IPOs and uh, led ops organizations through that. So um, really stoked to hear what y'all have to say um, about some of these, these questions here. Um, so first off, uh, just kind of want to start with um, around prioritization. So curious at, you know, managing RevOps organizations at uh, companies at various points in their growth, what are the ways that you determine uh, the most important projects and priorities as you're first building out your RevOps team? So think back to uh, maybe it's Yext at 30 employees or wherever anybody has been where they're uh, small and just building out a RevOps team. Um, what are the most important things to tackle first? And since Yex came to mind, I'm going to ask you, uh, Jenny, what you think to start. Yeah, you know, um, it's one of those things where I, I, at Yex, I felt like I learned, um, I learned at each stage of growth, um, and I think it does really matter what stage you're at in terms of what what is most important. I think something that's important, no matter what your stage is, is knowing the customer that you're trying to target 
And there are a lot of different ways to go about doing that. You know, ideal customer profiling is something that I actually just did again here at checkout this year. But just, you know, sort of whether it's based on market data or current customer base, if you have it, knowing where you're being successful, you know, looking at your win rates, looking at who's who your biggest Ooh. vendors are um, to understand that and then like go after lookalikes. I think it sounds like such a basic thing to do, but, you know, doing that ideal customer profile project and then going through data acquisition with the any number of data vendors that are out there to go find more accounts like that and get those out to your sales team just creates so much you know faster cycles for that team and more success um, and it's really low-hanging fruit but i think that it's something that um, not every company does and invests the right amount of effort in doing particularly up front that's uh, I wrote down go after lookalikes because I feel like that's that's like another way to say scaling, right? It's just like do the oh you did something well, just do that again forever and ever until we IPO and then beyond. Um, in terms of the like the um, the lookalikes, what attributes do you look at to uh, to kind of try and replicate? Is it like company size? Is it industry? Like what kind of things are you trying to put together to determine that ICP? Yeah, you know, for me, it changed a lot between Yaxt and Checkout. Um, Yaxt was very traditional uh, SaaS. Having said that, it wasn't a SaaS model built on user count, which a lot of SaaS models are. So even at Yext, we were having to look at sort of what made an ideal buyer based on how we were pricing our product, which was not traditional company size or user base. So we had like I'd already learned how to go into those sort of secondary firmographics, so to say. Um, at Yext, it, it started originally with um, uh, the number of physical stores that a company had pretty easy data to get. It ended up being that we also wanted to know how many website pages they had, sort of harder data to get, but still something you can get. Um, at checkout, it's really about, uh, because we're a payments processor, it's really about sort of the profile of payments that a company processes cross border, sort of what are their, the kinds of payments that they take, ACH, credit cards, you know, alternative payment methods, like what are their priorities? Um, and data vendors have gotten so good in the past like 10 years in terms of what they're scraping and what they're able to, to get for you. Um, and so we just try and get as many firmographics about both our current customers and prospects as possible. And then knowing how we price our product and what is influencing that pricing, trying to get the firmographics most closely aligned to that really helps us define lookalikes industry playing a big part in it as well, but it's it's that depth of the sort of secondary firmographics that have been really helpful for me. That's awesome. Thanks so much for sharing more about that. Um, Jenny um, Bushin, I saw you nodding quite a bit in, a, in a, what I assume yeah. is agreement. Um, so, anything, yeah, any experiences you want to share? I think one thing Jenny pointed out uh, was really is the data that's actually available, right? So. Uh, uh, there's a lot of it to and fro that happens while building that ICB profile. You sometimes know what to look for, but if you don't have the data available to go match that up, you'll have to find uh, parallels. Uh, like if you, for example, in Jenny's case, if they couldn't find the number of stores, uh, that becomes a challenge. In a way. You have to find something else that could be easily available. And I think uh, you should get an idea of what's there out in the market before you actually start doing that activity. Uh, because it can help you uh, streamline some of the say, uh, alignment specifically around your marketing and sales team, because not only should that information be available, that's also information you should be able to execute on and target. Because if those are not available, it's an insight, but it won't be actionable for you to actually act on. So uh, I think that becomes an important point, I think. So to repeat that back to you, Bush, and what you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, is like, don't spend too much time going after data points that are really hard to collect and try and find parallels or find you use the word parallels which i like that are are readily available so that you can leverage that information even if even if like with a magic wand you would go after a different data points sometimes it's just not like not always out there at least right now yeah exactly yeah is there is there um any particular uh, data point that you've like found in your current role that has been super 
um, useful, I guess, for the sales team in terms of, of finding the right ICP? Yeah, so uh, one thing that we target for is uh, teams that are business facing or maybe customer facing that we need to understand. So total headcount may not be a great uh, understanding for us to basically go after a particular business. And uh, employee size is something that is readily available for most organizations, but now you need to figure out how many of those are actually folks who are actually working with prospects and customers because those are the ones likely to be, let's say, on uh, variable compensation, right? And that's something that we want to target. So one thing that today is available, at least with the, uh, LinkedIn, is the type of role or categories they put employees into. So you can find a, you can't exactly find maybe salespeople, but there's something you can go and figure out that are likely prospect or customer facing roles. Tag those and use that as a parallel to go ahead and say these looks like the ideal size of companies that you want to go and target. Totally. We definitely use LinkedIn as well for that type of thing. Jake, were you about to jump in? Sorry, I'm not sure if I heard you. Uh, I, I, I wasn't going to, but I just doubled down on it. I think knowing why you win is so important and SaaS oftentimes gets slumped into the, this is the SaaS model. This is the way you do things. But I think there's now so many different buying models in SaaS and there's wall to wall licenses for employee. And sometimes it's land and expand. And sometimes again, it's just like the whole thing and you either have it or you don't. And I think really understanding why you win in each of those and what the strategies are is really important. So that RevOps, like what RevOps is really good at is bringing the data to bear that other folks don't have so they can make better decisions or action it in the right time. And uh, so I love this. I just double down on it and say that's that's a spot that revenue ops and sales ops can be really effective. Totally. Yeah, I think what I'm hearing is like, number one, if you don't understand, if you come into a RevOps organization or you're starting one, and you don't already, you can't already answer the question, why are we winning deals? Then you should probably go figure that out and yeah. then uh, work from there. Yeah, totally. Uh, yeah. Ryan. Yeah, so um, I was thinking about this question a little, a little differently. When when I tend to start in my last two companies, it's just coincidentally, like right before annual planning is, is wrapping up and, you know, the sales team is going to grow 3x and targets are 3x. And so where I've really started as my top priority is uh, getting an objective view into the sales funnel and the data and uh, putting a lot of a lot of data into Google Sheets and figuring out how we're actually measuring our funnel. But then coming up with a perspective on what is our actual rep productivity? Um, you know, as you're growing really quickly and as deals are coming in and you don't have the best handle as to why the reps are, you know, achieving or what the right quotas are, or how we should comp them, having that baseline understanding of productivity versus capacity is, is been really key for me um, and empowered us to, to really question certain areas where we wanted to grow the business uh, and add a lot of sales reps and then find other areas where we can really invest. And so um, the outcome is typically then have a better understanding of your funnel, what we can expect from the reps, making sure your finance plan has a level of understanding of the productivity per rep and not just the quotas finance wants to assign out. Um, making sure your conversion rates are very clear uh, and so that the top of the funnel is going to convert. Um, but what's been really um, valuable about coming in and just digging into the rep and, and the performance data has been empowering our sales managers on, on where to focus and giving them very clear goals uh, around you know, how many deals at what size. You know, this might seem really introductory, but when you're in this hyper growth startup and you're hiring RevOps too late and you're coming in as, you know, what are my initial priorities? Um, having data that you can align on with finance all the way down to the sales managers and their team has been, has been critical for me. Yeah, I would agree with Ryan on that uh, wholeheartedly. I also think that having a model that you share with finance, like alleviates so much of that finance plan, sales, you know, execution friction that I think just happens naturally, you know, particularly at high growth companies. Um, and it makes, sales ops or rev ops, the, um, not the mediator, but almost, you know, like the, the group that brings those two together and says, yes, we've set a finance plan, but also um, it's a plan that we've tested against historicals and against real productivity and against real headcount growth. And we like clearly see a path to hit it. Um, and I also think that in today's, you know, to Ryan's point on annual planning, 
in today's economy, every company, even if they're growing, needs to be growing smart and understanding where your reps are most productive, whether it's regions or segments, lets you pick that right next headcount to invest in um, so that it's not just, you know, a, a guess about where you're going to get the best return on investment, but you're actually putting those investment dollars in the place that's going to return the best growth for the company. Yeah, one thing I, I enjoy about you just laying out this type of data for sales and finance is you often find areas where you're not aligned and you thought you were, right? Like a, how many reps, what percentage of your reps should be achieving quota each month or each quarter, right? It might seem like a simple question, but that's a different answer at different orgs. Um, and typically at the startups I've been at early, people don't actually know how many reps are hitting quota. The sales comp files is kind of stored over in the corner and you know, certain reps are happy. But just align, are we looking at 60%? 80 percent 100 percent what are what are we trying to align to um those are conversations that i've had to drive as as a rev ops leader in the past that were were just not thought of as you were moving so quickly yeah yeah i think you know it's funny that you say that because we, I, I see that every day and i think the other thing that happens early is not just how many reps but early in a company you're still trying to figure out all the overhead on a rep how many SEs do you need how many, you know, value edge, how many of this, how many of that, depending on the org. And that's so different depending on, on the product of the organization you're in. And I think all of those things really being in lockstep with finance because they need to be funded alongside with the AEs. Otherwise your AEs won't be successful is really, really important. So you got to bring them along. You have to have proof points along the way and then goals like, you know, for the future, you know, how, what percentage of my org do I want to be quota capacity front facing reps versus folks that help them out versus CSMs or other things on the back end. Uh, so I, I found it very valuable to be in front and have models that you're testing along the way with finance to ensure you're in lockstep. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting to hear like the uh, basically two top things that, you know, might one one might beat out the other, depending on what's going on at your company when you start a RevOps org, but it's like understanding your customer and then also looking inward and understanding mm -hmm what we're doing internally and in our sales motion and in our processes that are leading us to wins and how can we, uh, you know, get people to, as Jenny said, like go after lookalikes in like a process way. Right. Um, Cause that's essentially what like process is, is just like uh, trying to lead people into, into the next win. Um, one thing that's interesting is like, because I'm leading a CS team, I couldn't really relate as much to like the uh, understanding your customer in ICP because we, we essentially just deal with our ICP. So in that way, we kind of have like the extra looking inward um, because we don't have to worry so much about the ICP part of it. Um, and so we like in the past year have, have done so much uh, process alignment um, and all that stuff to kind of get, get the lookalikes to happen. I'm going to really be using that Jenny forever. So thank you. Um, yeah. But yeah, interesting how like sales and CS, you know, it's it's like selling, but it's just like different challenges. Um, but that said, um, a lot of a lot of people alluded to RevOps hiring, um, and I think Brian, you mentioned uh, like hiring RevOps too late, kind of as if it's like a, a thing that happens across all startups, which I'm inclined to to agree. Um, we don't even have anybody in RevOps at Atrium yet, <laughs> which is kind of crazy um, at 60 people. Um, but the, the next question that I was curious about for everybody was, what should you look for in a first RevOps hire? So um, assuming that, you know, you come in, you're a RevOps leader and it's time to grow out the team. Um, what, what is the first thing you look for? And um, Ryan, I'm going to start with you just because I had uh, quoted you as my intro to this question. No, um, appreciate that. Uh, I mean, I really look for someone who's going to be proactive uh, and somebody that has uh, an analytical skill set. Um, I'm also thinking about it from building a remote sales team. And uh, my last company was fully remote. And if you had people that would suffer in silence, that weren't proactive, that weren't strong communicators, you would often check in and you wouldn't see your projects moving. So, um, you know, you need somebody that's more of a generalist as you start to hire, right? That can go throughout the whole funnel, can handle all the way from marketing to, you know, close to cash. Um, but really, I want somebody that has ambitious career goals, um, a very proactive mindset, as I said, uh, strong spreadsheet skills, because we're going to be doing a lot of number crunching um, and we need data. And 
early on, whether your, your data architecture is lacking or there's, there's holes in your reporting, you need to find a way to come up with, with data sets. So um, always look for somebody that, you know, finds a good time, you know, spending Friday night in a Google sheet, you know, working through different things with me uh, to try and figure out where we can, where we can grow the business. Um, and of course you want to specialize over time, but um, that's just what I look for. Somebody that's going to come in and, and can have those presentation skills and really is, wants to be a problem solver is coachable um, and really hungry to, to grow with the company. So um, I found that through SDRs in the past. I found that through management consulting folks. Um, I tend to have, uh, you want to have a bullpen of folks that you've worked with in the past. Um, that's always very valuable, of course. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think that kind of sums up for me. Yeah, that's that's super helpful. Thank you. Um, I, I quoted the no suffering in silence thing because it's like, yeah, you want somebody who's going to be like, um, this looks wrong or have you seen this or uh, you want that person who, who has an eye for detail to catch the, the thing in the spreadsheet or the Salesforce report that looks off. Um, and looking at everyone's LinkedIn's before this, um, I noticed, you know, the wide array of, of experience that everybody on this panel had. Um, Bushin, yours st stood out to me because you came from a, a consulting background at, at Deloitte, I think it was. So yeah. I would be curious to hear what you think around, um, you know, hiring for your first RevOps person as somebody who uh, doesn't have like, you know, the, the traditional necessarily RevOps background. So, uh... I think actually consulting that we found at least we had a team of about 70 people back uh, at Freshworks uh, and the first analysts that we recruited were typically not from a traditional RevOps background at least for India RevOps back in 2017 as he was still taking off we didn't have like a ton of population who had already existed and worked in that role uh, and we found that consultants actually as Ryan mentioned seem to be a better fit because they are generalists and they are sort of introduced to new problems on a daily basis they have to figure out how to, what are the challenges, what would be the right process to go solve this. And again, they require a ton of data skills to be able to make those assessments. So they have basically all the basic working skills that you would need to succeed in a role like RevOps. And if uh, you can't find someone with a RevOps background, then they seem to be the next best thing uh, to bring them in because again, uh, I think uh, one thing Ryan mentioned that you really like is the presentation skills. You can have the best solution in the world, but you also have to sell that solution to your leadership and stakeholders and get them aligned. If uh, you don't do a great job of that, uh, it's going to be very hard executing without having all those folks on board. That's such a good point um, because I think like the the alignment between the sales team and the revenue operations team is super important. And um, if you're trying to help sellers, you know, run their, their business better and run their motion better, you're going to need to have some selling skills yourself because uh, they will objection you, you know, you're gonna have to objection handle, like it's, it's definitely important. So that's a really, really interesting point. Um, Bushin, a follow-up question to you is like, so uh, you, hiring consult, former consultants as uh, RevOps folks, what do you think is the thing that they need to get, like where are they lacking before they come in where you kind of need to help them catch up? Like they have the presentation skills, they have the data skills, they're good at problem solving. Uh, what's kind of the thing that you're like, all right, we need to mold this part of them to be really good at RevOps? And the big thing is the execution follow through because a lot of consultants come in and their job is to sort of present a plan, right? And they are really included in actually executing the plan on the ground. Uh, this is now different. You're basically an internal consultant and you have full ownership end to end, right from the strategizing and planning part of it to actually delivering results. So that needs a different level of attention to detail in terms of uh, just your project management in general. It has to be so much more tighter in terms of, uh, hey, there are tight deadlines that need to wait here not just responsible for creating the plan and leaving, you're actually going to have to go in, get the results and make sure everyone's actually aligned and get this job done. So I think that follow through is something that needs to be trained in to folks a little bit. But yeah, if again, if they have been a strong professional in their previous careers, it is something that is uh, typically, uh, again, a trait of a strong professional, they'll actually make that happen. That's really interesting. Yeah, it's like, Hey, you're not just the ideas guy or girl anymore. <laughs> you're also executing, especially in RevOps, like at, you know, a startup, like, or just at a startup in general, you are wearing all the hats and uh, you are owning things from start to finish, which 
I think um, if I could go back in time and be an IC again, or if I ever am an IC again, I will be a lot better at it because I will kind of understand that um, on a deeper level, having been a, a leader of a team at this point. Um, but thank you, thank you, uh, Ryan and, and Bushin for that. Um, a follow up uh, to that kind of on that same thread around hiring for RevOps. Um, Jake, I'm curious, like in terms of an interview process for gauging RevOps hires, um, what's some what's a process that's worked for you? Yeah, I think um, I think first you want to make sure that whoever you hire in RevOps, you have a panel that's diverse, meaning you have a both diversity in talent, but also diversity in roles. So you, you definitely want to make sure this your stakeholders are part of that, whether that's whoever your sales or CS or support or services. If this person's going to support that team, they should be bought into that person. And I think it's important to bring them into the sales process kind of in the, in the midway. Um, two, I think it is very important to have a proof point. Uh, so if this person is a commissions hire, some type of project that's kind of aligned with that, or if this person's uh, going to be your first hire and kind of do everything, I think you're going to want something around territories or quota or something that's kind of like a foundational project that you know this person's going to be involved in. Um, I think that's really important. And the third thing that I think you should always have is, is some type of um, some type of interview which is really just focused on the person's values and background and how he or she got to where where that person is today. I think the biggest predictor of success in an organization isn't necessarily the first two things, but is the latter is, does this person have those qualities and those motivations that align with our culture, with the stage we're in and with where we want to go? Um, I also think it's the thing that interview interviewers need to be trained on how to do the most. You know, what does that look like? How do you ask those leading questions? Um, to have that discussion. In fact, you know, at, at Sales Loft, we, we do that, of course. And then when that person starts, it's really important for the managers to kind of have a follow up and almost have that discussion again, because it's, it's also a great way to get to know somebody. So making sure the panel is well represented, making sure the person has technical aptitude. And I, I really do think a test or something like that's important, not something that's going to compete with their workload. Everyone's too busy, but something that takes an hour and can differentiate people, something like that. And then uh, some type of uh, an interviewer that's really more fo focused on someone's values and background and why why they made the decisions they made in their past, whatever those decisions were. That's super helpful, Jake. Thanks. Um, I'm 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 literally over here taking notes on what everybody says because we will be hiring somebody in RevOps at some point, I'm sure. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm getting some gold here. Um, Cool. Um, thanks so everybody for sharing on that. Um, I think that uh, we're kind of, you know, we're starting at the beginning um, for these first couple of questions around what should priorities be when you start a RevOps organization? How do you hire for that um, that role? Um, and I think like, you know, moving moving down the funnel, if you will, of the RevOps journey, um, having been in RevOps myself, especially at the start of my career, I found myself often kind of a report jockey. Um, so somebody that somebody would slack for a report, um, you know, at all hours of the day or night, whether or not that was possible, I, I learned in real time. Um, but uh, I think a lot of people who have worked in RevOps um, can relate to that. And, you know, it's really the last thing that we want for a RevOps team is to be stuck in serial reporting land in, you know, Salesforce or otherwise. So um, this question is around how have you successfully positioned uh, RevOps as a strategic partner to the sales team, CS, marketing teams, finance teams even, um, it really is in the middle of all those. So um, any tips for, for how to do that? And I, I think we'll start with uh, Jenny. Yeah, you know, it's... Uh, it's a hard balance, I think, because my approach to it and what I always tell my team is like, you have to make sure all the trains run on time. That's just table space, table stakes. So that everyone gets paid, that reports go out, that everyone has territories, you know, and some of that feels administrative and it, it always will. Um, you know, I think that the trick becomes automation <laughs> and like automating yourself out of that work becomes really important. Um, and then it frees up the time to also anticipate the next need. Um, and I'm a big believer that, you know, sort of, we all talked at, a, at the start is called not about the tactical, you know, not about Salesforce, not about 
reporting. And so it's a great question now, because in some ways where we started was strategy about like, how do we help the organization drive strategy? My take is that the seat at the strategy table is never given, it's always earned. Um, and so I think it's the, you know, ensuring that the org has what it needs, listening and watching for problems, almost like we tell our sales reps to solution sell and to sell to their pains. Like we should be doing that to our sales orgs and our CS orgs is understanding the pain of our customer and then solving for it. And then that seat is very eagerly given to say, okay, you solved a problem for me. Here's another problem. Here's a bigger problem. Here's the next thing. Or just the shift of responsibility, which is like, you understand my business, like you tell me what I'm missing. Um, and so I think it's like, it's hard yards in the early days, but if you can automate yourself out of being that recording jockey, um, it really lets you um, solve big problems for the company, but you never skip that first step, in my opinion. Yeah, it's like, you got to do the the like making sure the trains run on time. I mean, I think for, for CSMs, it's like emails and meetings, right? Like you gotta be having your meetings, you gotta be sending your emails and then everything else, like strategy comes after that. Um, you, there's a certain, like you can't escape it, right? There's no shortcuts. And um, yeah, that's a, it's a good thing to like, accept, you know, the responsibility of owning the reporting, um, but doing your best to, you know, make that reporting as evergreen as you can um and and automate that and i guess when you say automate jenny can you elaborate a little bit more on like examples of what that automation could be yeah you know i think automation really comes down to like three things the first of which is that you have some amount of agreement across various groups whether it's different regions or different stakeholders that you're going to report on things in the same way and they're meant to be like standard metrics um, if everyone has their own flavor of metric, you can never get to automation, not to mention they'll all be talking a different language when they get to the table and they'll have different numbers, which will be a disaster. Um, the second piece is tooling. Salesforce is great, but it's not a data warehouse and it doesn't have trends over time and it doesn't do a great job with snapshotting. Um, and so just like understanding its limitation and understanding what tools like Looker or Tableau or um, or other tools you might want to layer on top of it. Um, uh, and I think the third piece is just like, you know, having that technical skill and, and lots of folks talked about having an analytical mindset. Um, there's so much training that's available today on how to get more technical. And if you have the right early hires, even if they don't join your team um, as technical folks, getting them the training of how to work on scheduling reports, building dashboards, and having the systems actually just run and send that data, um, I think is sort of like how I think about the three steps that you need to, to get to where that reporting just flows um, and no one needs to intervene in making it happen. Mm -hmm. That is definitely uh, the dream state for sure. <laughs> you can hear my sigh because I'm like, oh, that sounds great. <laughs> um, and I feel like especially key for running an efficient, you know, running a tight ship at a large organization like Yextra Checkout. I mean, um, you can't have like, it can't be left up to human error or uh, needing somebody to get involved every time a report needs to be run at, at that scale. Um, Ryan, I'm, I'm interested to hear um, what you think around kind of like earning that place at the strategy table, especially, um, you know, considering you were leading the RevOps charge with Divi through the Bill.com acquisition. Um, what does it kind of look like in terms of strategy when there's an acquisition on the table? Yeah, um, you know, one area I struggled with earlier in my career was internal PR, right? And I think that that is um, an undervalued superpower. And when you come into a startup or even a public company, there's a lot of the senior leadership that may not have worked with a strong RevOps function in their past, right? And so I always make sure to uh, go on listening tours, but then to really create a vision as to how RevOps will partner with those leaders. And especially at, at the earlier startups, I try to drive alignment between how I'm gonna structure this RevOps team and what the roles and responsibilities are and have dotted line alignment to the different revenue leaders. So 
uh, at Divi, we hired uh, our first customer success operations leader and dotted lined him to the VP of customer success. And, you know, we informed them that you are the COO of this organization and you are there to help bring data. You need to have a strong command of the business. Um, one of the things that I always found frustrating in RevOps is you get asked to build these elaborate reports or analysis and then you deliver them and you're happy with your work and crickets, right? You feel like nobody's even looked at them or acknowledged the, the, the work. And so one of the things I always explain to my team is we're going to vet those requests. We're going to, of course, steer them to provide the right value for the business, but we're responsible for understanding those reports and the insights and you are responsible to have strong command of your business. So... I know that if I can't make a meeting, that my head of customer success ops is there, has a strong command of the business, and is helping inform leaders as to the data and the trends uh, and areas of strength. So I think uh, getting a seat at that strategy table is around, one, informing your leadership. Here's what we're here to do, and here are the things we're going to work on, um, and following through, of course, but then uh, also making sure that you have that command of the business you take the time to understand the direction uh, and then you're, you're really providing value at, at a higher level. Um, I also always scare my team when I, I come on board and I show them some slides from you know, different thought leadership teams that I don't typically leverage, but I want to show them slides that here are things that a high performing RevOps team should be owning, right? Budgeting, territory management, sales incentives, things that we're not doing. So they understand like, oh, we're going to shake this up a bit. We have really high aspirations and we are going to be involved in a lot more things than the tactical responsive tickets and reports and um, empower the team to talk trade-offs, right? If you have a sales leader that really wants a big in-depth analysis on win loss over the past 24 months, great, we can do that, but you're going to be missing out on uh, the territory management, the quota set, like we're going to have to reprioritize. So empower your team to talk trade-offs as well. Jake, yeah, I, think, I see you nodding. <laughs> well, I think that's right. I just have two comments to add that I think is really important. One, one of the things we tell our analysts is use these asks to take a strategic seat at the table. So win-loss, if you're being asked to, pr to produce that report on win-loss, take that next step, provide some outcomes from that or, or some trends or things that you notice, and then volunteer to take that next step because you want to be the CEO of your business. Say, hey, I'm going to meet with X RVP, AVB, whoever it is. And I want to talk about what I'm seeing in your top 20% of your reps versus like the bottom 80%. And like, then all of a sudden you're part of that strategic conversation. And I feel like once you do that a few times, then all of a sudden um, the sales teams kind of take advantage of it because they, they want it to. And then uh, the only thing I'd say about the M&A piece, from, from my experience, the most important thing when you come on board is one, to understand why you were bought in the first place. Like if you become part of an acquisition, because there's all these use cases and, and understand that and then provide and help your CRO or your CFO with two or three things that you're going to do in the next quarter that you're going to report to everyone, their head of RevOps, their CFO, et cetera, and align on what those things are and then hit them. Because I think the biggest thing is to build trust in the first quarter or two. And once you build trust, it's amazing how much runway you get to keep executing but if you miss that or you don't build the trust, the the go to motion is to be consolidated into the general motion, which may or may not be right. Um, so those, those are two things I'd add. It sounds like everybody here would agree that uh, being like taking that seat rather than waiting for that seat to be given to you. I mean, I'm basically quoting Jenny there, but everyone else has kind of said similar things. I think like um, as as a you know leader of the CS team, like I have a very good understanding of what's going on with our team. But anytime uh, we actually we we don't have RevOps, but we do have somebody who uh, does some like operational work for us. And every time she's like, "Hey, I just want to let you know I saw something," uh, you know, in the in like the forecast or in usage or whatever. I am so grateful for the second set of eyes, right? When like there's a proactive insight coming from somebody else. Um, because I think, you know, every every team leader, um, sales, CS, uh, marketing, what have you, is really heads down in tunnel vision in their own day-to-day, uh, -day, which, you know, they like can't really be helped. And so getting somebody else to be like, hey, you know, I'm not going to suffer in silence over here. I'm going to point something out to you. Um, 
that you may not be aware of. Um, that's just like such a such a gift, right, for any leader. Um, and then if, if anything, you know, maybe it's not an actual problem, but you can have a great discussion about it um, and keep an eye on it together. And if it is a, a problem and something we're tackling, then you can do that in real time rather than looking back and being like, wow, I wish I would have known that sooner. Um, thank you, everybody. This is this is so great. And uh, we will have, a, I think, time for one more question here. Um, and I think just in general, like the the word, well, there's RevOps and then there's revenue enablement. And of course, those are kind of like different things. Um, but I think, you know, ultimately what we've talked about today is how to um, how to help leaders and teams um, perform at their best so that the company can grow and continue to be successful. And um, I've kind of thought about revenue enablement versus revenue empowerment. And I feel like everybody here is trying to, uh, you know, empower rather than just enable because enable can kind of be like, enabling bad habits, right? Um, and so I guess I'm curious um, if anybody has any thoughts on like how best to empower um, a sales team, let's say, to perform at their best. Is it with information, data, insights, automation processes? Um, Bhushan, um, anything comes to mind for you? So I think uh, a big chunk of that is a combination of things. Uh, it, it's not typically one thing or the other. Uh, as an example, one major challenge that we faced earlier was we were dealing with a huge volume of leads coming in and by the time it got to people, it was already stale or it was taking too long that immediately had an impact on conversion rates. Now, automating that process, bringing that time down by a factor of, let's say, 10, really helps basically get sales encouraged that, hey, this is happening. This team is actually showing some level of impact, right? And uh, finally, now the next question you can go and ask them is, hey, now you have the lead that's come to you quickly for the next steps, right? How can you go ahead and optimize to basically make those reach outs work? So the idea is always not to just provide insights, but to provide actionable insights and with a bit of an execution plan attached to it. So now that we've, uh, as example I was stating, we got those needs quickly enough to the sales rep. The idea is do, they, do you have a clear cadence of what to do next? Do you have a SLA when you need to reach out to that lead? How long will you reach out to that lead quickly, right? Like it shouldn't sit in your inbox for a long time. Uh, without actually, if I were to just go and try to enforce the second part without actually solving for the first, it may not work out well or again, we not, may not get the right results out of it. So to basically make that work, as I said, uh, having actionable insights provided to all the leaders, because when they see the value in it, they are most likely going to work with you to go ahead and make that and put that into action. So uh, how do you frame the problem in a scenario where you have an execution plan as associated with it? So basically an insight, but also with some action and accountability there as well. Yeah. 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 Um, Jenny, anything that comes to mind for you in terms of revenue empowerment? Yeah. You know, I sort of think about it as you know, revenue enablement at its core has to be about your product and your company and just giving people the skills to do their job. And I think revenue empowerment is about giving them the skills to do their next job almost. And that's where I think that revenue enablement teams can take it to the next level with soft skill training. Um, and I know that sounds uh, sort of straightforward and also maybe something like you'd expect their managers to give them. But I, it's something that we're investing a lot in here in role coaching um, and actually helping people upskill. You know, so whether it's CSMs learning how to sell um, or uh, learning how to be industry experts and have that consultative mindset. Um, and even for most tenured sales reps, you know, I always use the comparison that like uh, great golfers still take golf lessons, you know, just because you're good at something doesn't mean that you don't go back and, and, and relearn and get rid of bad habits. Um, and so I think the same for our sales team, like we're, I think that if you have the room to start doing more of that role coaching or more of that soft skill, training um it elevates the profile of your enablement team but it also really helps other people invest in their careers and that's like an amazing gift that you can give people and and it helps with retention and it helps with employee tenure and internal mobility and it has so many sort of um benefits that come off of that flywheel that's yeah there's a lot of a lot of great stuff in there um around like yeah, love the great golfers still take golf lessons. Um, and I think it also pushes 
that mindset pushes revenue team revenue enablement teams to like think ahead and up level you know their own games too um which is you know really what's needed is like self starters in the revenue org to move the, the company forward um, i think we have time for one more of one more answer to this so jake um if you can wrap us up here with what uh you can do to empower your revenue teams yeah i think on that one two things i think career ladders and career, career ladders within a company is so important especially in like fast growing companies the companies have set it up well between different roles with multiple promotion paths ideally multiple um, and revenue enablement teams that teach them their current job but, but empower them to take steps into their future job when they're still in the previous job sets them up for success in the next role reduces all the other challenges that folks face around attrition and, and folks leaving for other jobs and, and, and things like that it allows you to actually coach um, your talent. Who's more challenging your bottom 10% a little bit more arduously because you know, you have talent to backfill. So I think that just sets up so many other emotions within the company. And the other, the last thing I'll say is I think a big challenge um, in this world in the sales world is consistency of execution. You're going to have your top reps. You're going to be your top reps here and elsewhere. They're it just, it will, there's going to be a bottom and that's, that's always true. It's that middle 80%. And the more you can do to empower by saying, these are your goals. These are the North star metrics. And then giving these reps or these CSMs or whoever it is insights to how they perform against them. It gives them the right to like step up into that because they know what it looks like and that creates more consistency across your organization and that will create better performance overall that was awesome jake thanks so much um and and with that said um i'm gonna invite eduardo from the mst msp team to jump back in here and wrap us up but thank you all for this amazing conversation i wish we could do this for another hour <laughs> Panelists, that was amazing. What a great way to start our second day of summit. Um, audience, please make sure to stick around. We have a masterclass with Pete Kazanji coming up soon. So stick around and don't miss out for the rest of the day. We have amazing events coming up. I'll see you later. Bye-bye.